We're in the business of taking problem properties and problem seller situations and unlocking the hidden potential in things. I have a real passion for doing that in buildings in particular. This building was going into foreclosure. It was uh, highly vacant. All the retail was vacant on the main level. It was a drug problem in the building here and there was security problems so people didn't feel safe in the building. This building, we've kind of named it the Juan Building because John Juan was the original builder in 1879. So it was actually built before um, building permits in the city of St. Paul. He was, like many people in St. Paul, an immigrant. He actually was from Ireland. So a lot of folks came with some money in the pockets um, wanting to make more money. Lower Town was more successful where we are here and grew kind of out as a warehousing, jobbing, factory district. And it was lower level, so they weren't going up the cliffs like they were in Upper Town. And so they could really unload these trains in the 1860s or boats earlier than that and get them in these buildings. But this building had many factories in it. It was, it was a spice factory. It was a hat factory. It had um, a shirt company in it. And this one actually had many fires this building did. It's kind of amazing that buildings actually made it. My vision for this building is to restore it to an economically viable and contributing participant to the lower town community. These really tall historic ceilings, the new historic charm of this building is gonna be so incredible. And then we're gonna mix in some modern elements so that people kind of get the best of the new world and the charm of the old world combined. Keeping the built fabric is pretty awesome and doing new construction within the built environment is even more creative and fantastic. And it's made a pretty vibrant community in Lower Town, one that didn't even exist 10 years ago. I just feel uh, so honored to be able to take a historic building like this and have the opportunity to restore its charm, restore its beauty, and restore its economic vitality to bring it back as a great operating member and a cornerstone of this community. So this is what one of the studios looks like. This one has its own washer and dryer. So what we did is we added kitchens and bathrooms to these units. We're leaving the kind of historic wood floors and then some of the brick and we're restoring these historic windows with insulated glass units. So you'll see they kind of have these historic timbers and beams and stuff like that as well. This will be finished off with nice white shaker cabinets, quartz countertops and modern stainless appliances. Just wanted to give you guys an update on what's happening down in the basement here. We, uh, we got this all demoed out. This is going to be kind of the bonus income for our project. We realized that uh, there's a big need for storage on these commercial buildings. There's kind of some legends that the mob used to use this building. And believe it or not, if you come down here, there was a door uh, and then on the other side it was dirt. Why would the mob be using uh, a dirt wall and then have it walled off with brick? I don't know, but let's just say we're not doing any excavating in this portion of the building because uh, we don't know what we're going to find. This space here is actually going to be uh, a speakeasy. So we're still in the basement level underneath the main floor retail and we secured a 10 year uh, absolute net lease where this is going to be a cool speakeasy that's going to have a different bar and there's another location that they already have. This will be their second location. This is going to be uh, a bar, a restaurant concept called the Rusty Mile. And we have actually the state's largest bar here. We're going to repurpose that. It's going to be cool. All along the perimeter here, you'll see the historic brick exposed. And we're going to have all new storefront going in. That's going to be an aluminum clad storefront with insulated glass in it. The building's uh, 130 years old, so inherently it's going to have a lot of challenges from that standpoint, um, existing issues that need to be remedied. The good news on this is we're not opening up a lot of walls and things like that, and we also did build in a pretty large contingency. We did find asbestos and lead-based paint on this project. Surprise for a building built in 1888. 
Um, but we did um, get approval from the city of St. Paul that they would support our application to the Met Council for a particular grant which would help us uh, ease the burden of some of those costs. This is what happens when we have a polar vortex and a clogged roof drain. Ah, uh, yeah. Yeah, so what we have done this week, I realized that once everything started freezing on the gas lines behind the structure that we had to put up. There's gas lines back here? Yes, there is. Okay. Uh, we actually <laughs> took a hose. We ran it from third floor down here. We drained our hot water heater that we have got most of the ice damming off. Our, you think this one's going to make the Guinness Book of World Records? I would think we'd be close. <laughs> <laughs> so with the lean-to that we have set up now, um, our plan is also uh, this afternoon to go behind, get all of the ice off of the gas meters again. Okay. We're going to do a flashing on the back side of the wall to completely eliminate any water coming back towards the gas lines because we want to make sure that everybody is safe and we don't mess with gas. The permanent solution here is to tie into the storm sewer, right? Correct. So the city basically requires when you replace a roof that you tie the new roof into the storm sewer. We're not tied in, so what we actually have to do is run two new eight inch pipes all the way from the roof down the inside of the building, dig up from the building all the way to the storm drain, which is about 100 yards down the alleyway here, replace all the historic pavers, put it all back together, and that's how we solve the problem. So that when the roof drains, it drains directly into the storm sewer. And then there's a secondary for backup. I think we're several thousand dollars into that. And those aren't things that you put uh, as line items in your initial budget. So there's been several things like that that have come up. And that's where, no matter how much experience you have, every single project always has surprises. And that's where you have to kind of go in eyes wide open, knowing that you have enough contingency money in there to cover those things. Looks like we got another problem down here. Uh, some major water issues. So we are actually standing underneath an old historic part of the sidewalk. Uh, we actually have these arches overhead and we are actually underneath a concrete slab upstairs. And what's happening is with the polar vortex, we have uh, a lot of freezing and all that water is melting and coming down here into our basement, creating a nice little flood in the basement. So interesting. What we've done to try and uh, mitigate the problem or minimize it is we have these uh, super professionally done uh, tarp apparatus that are dropping the water into commercial grade buckets. So uh, this is definitely a temporary solution and we shouldn't have to deal with this issue going forward. The challenge to doing these historic remodels is trying to fit the new economically feasible plans into the historic mold. And ultimately, you have to deal with some outside governing bodies who have to like and sign off on your final plans. The historic tax credit is a 20% tax credit for the state and 20% for the feds, which is pretty significant. And it's really the only way I think a lot of these buildings would still work because they're tricky and, they're, and rehabs, historic rehabs are more expensive than just slapping up. A new building. They get to kind of go through and tell you, well, we don't like this, we don't like that, we want you to keep this and we want you to keep that. And, and part of the challenge is a lot of it's moldings and things like that that you don't necessarily want to keep because they're in disrepair, but they want you to restore them. Probably if you weren't doing a historic remodel, you would replace those elements. For example, the windows behind us, we would probably replace them with high energy efficient units that look similar, but in this case, the option for us is to kind of just replace the glass panes within the existing frames. A lot of developers come in and they want perfect angles. They want a brand new building in a historic tax credit rehab. And I say, you know, let's fall in love with some of the quirks because you're going to have to keep in this building the fire escape. And you, it may be in the way and you may not like it, but it's pretty cool. 
There's some of that where you're kind of like, you don't really understand why they want things. And you see that it's really to stay true to the historic charm and just taking pleasure in being able to restore a lot of those elements. And that's really why they're giving you the credits. Well, after two years, we finally finished the project. I'm so excited to present the final walkthrough of the main floor retail spaces. Originally, we were gonna do a restaurant here and we had signed a 10-year lease, but between a government shutdown, uh, several months of rioting, and COVID-19, that tenant ended up not performing on the lease. With that being said, we kind of shifted gears and there is more of a demand for kind of these flexible units where people can either live in them or work in them. And so we decided, given all the market conditions, that it made more sense to chop the space into smaller live-work units. And so I want to tour you through those. We ended up doing three live-work units and then one larger retail space. Come with me. So here is kind of the work portion of it. And you can see we kind of blended all the same finishes of upstairs where we have the drywall and the trim, the historic looking wood floors. These are all brand new kind of juxtaposed against this nice historic brick and the brand new storefronts. And then I'll take you back through here. The back half of this is meant to really be more of the living style. And so you can use the front half for any kind of retail or office type use. And then the back half here is really meant to be a studio with a full kitchen, all new LED lighting. And then we have a two part bathroom back here. The front half of it's the public facing bathroom, which has a vanity and a toilet. And the back half is the private where the washer and dryer and the tubs are. Look at how cool this is. This is again, another live work unit or it could be used for small retail. The idea was to chop these into smaller spaces so they become more leasable. So you have a kitchen here. We could obviously remove this and do a commercial kitchen or some kind of racking, anything like that. And then you kind of have the apartment portion in the back corner. And here we are just putting the finishing touches on the mechanical system for the large middle unit. Originally we were going to do a yoga studio in here. It's available for lease right now. We went with the nice wood floors uh, again up against the brick on the walls and we're just finishing it off with uh, mechanical and sprinkler systems here this week and then we'll uh, be able to sign leases on this unit. Woo! Welcome to the historic corridor. One of the things that I love most about this is how dark these floors turned out. This has zero stain on these natural historic floors and they just really were brought back to life. These are the original floors. This is also the original brick here and just it's amazing what a coat of paint will do. If you look over here, I'd actually love to point out this five panel historic doors. These babies ran about 4,500 bucks a pop and they are spectacular. I'm super excited to show you how these historic windows turned out. Check these bad chickens out. 1,441 insulated glass units. We had to remove asbestos, reglaze them, new glass units. And the best part is that these things operate. So that to me is one of the coolest features of this building. Uh, we did this custom baseboard to hide the conduit. We did these custom LED lights. And really what we're trying to do here is blend this new world amenities, stainless steel appliances. Uh, we left uh, nothing to spare here. We went with the full extension, soft close, white shaker cabinets, soft close on the doors and the drawers. Uh, we went with upgraded stainless steel appliances. We're trying to give that luxury feel where we combine the modern of the new world, like the quartz countertops, with the historic old world, like these uh, historic floors, which I think turned out really beautiful. And then we have these kind of historic pillars and beams and stuff. We were able to salvage this barn door here, and that turned out so cool. Um, and we were able to kind of keep that feature there. So. Uh, this building is cool because we got 23 units on the upper floors and no two units are alike. So now I'm going to show you another kind of smaller studio space if you come with me. So come on in. I want to show you what one of these little studios looks like. The first thing you're going to see is a full wall of windows, which is just so rare for these smaller, more economical units. This thing will rent for about a thousand bucks a month right now. Um, and that includes storage and internet. Of course, prices are going to change over time. 
Um, but this is, you know, for a studio unit to have an actual full kitchen with full appliances, including the dishwasher, quartz countertops, um, just really cool features in here, lots of light. And then you can take a peek here. We just went with kind of a modern, simple and clean bathroom. After two long years, a lot of problems, we came out on top. So thanks a lot for coming along on this journey. I was so excited to walk you through this project as it took shape over the years here. And I'm excited to bring you another project soon. Stay tuned.